Should I start? Um, okay, so we did with the, the lens equation, which connects the flexion angle to the actual change that we try. <laughs> and so what we ended up with was a relationship between beta, which is the position of an unlensed source, and theta, which is the position where we actually see the images on the sky. And so the difference, this quantity here, which I'm calling the reduced uh, deflection angle, is simply how much the source actually moves on the sky as a result of the gravitational energy. Right? It's the difference between the image position and the source position. Before I've been using the notation that the deflection angle was alpha. From now on, I'm going to use uh, uh, alpha as the scaled deflection angle. So I'm going to incorporate this factor dds over ds into alpha, where I want to use the actual deflection angle that I used before. I'm going to do that. So this is the this gradient of the lensing potential that we derived before. That gives you the angle. If you multiply by 4 over c squared, that's now the actual deflection angle alpha hat. This is now the scaled deflection angle, which is the amount the image moves on the sky as a result of that. So our lensing equation is now about as simple as you can get it. Beta is theta minus alpha. And all the information is in the dependence of this deflection, the scaled deflection position on the sky. And that's what gives you all the richness, all the uh, all the behavior that you can get. And of course, the other thing we saw is how to turn the surface mass density of your lens into the lensing potential, which defines your deflection angle, which defines your scale deflection angle. Right? Is this microphone working? Um, so now let's look at um, uh, at a special case, which is quite common, which is the axisymmetric lensing case. In that case, our lensing potential is just a function of radius to some point, some symmetry. <coughs> and as before, we have the relation between the surface mass density and the potential. And we can now uh, use the symmetry that we have and apply the divergence theorem over some disk. So we take some disk on the sky of radius r. The potential is symmetric about r, so all the gradients and all the reflection angles are radial. And this biodivergence theorem is equal to the, the surface integral of the uh, of the radial gradient outwards around this volume. So as a volume, we take this disk of radius r, so we integrate over this entire disk, and that's equal to the circumference, the integral along the circumference of that same disk of radius r. And so this here by the, the, the Poisson theorem that we have is equal to 2 pi d. Times the surface density over that disk, and the right hand side is by symmetry equal to simply the circumference of the disk times the radial gradient. And this here, of course, is simply equal to you integrate the surface density over a certain area, you simply get the total mass in that area. So this is the mass within that within that disk times two pi. And this radial gradient of the potential we know as well, it's equal to flexion angle here. C squared over four. Uh, 
times the unscaled reflection angle, which we're now calling alpha hat. So therefore we can relate the reflection angle to the enclosed mass for the case of an axisymmetric lens. And so we can write, for example, um, Just the product of the radius times the reflection angle and some dimensional constants. Now, this is where we can define this critical surface density that we talked about briefly at the beginning. And that's by considering what we call an Einstein ring. An Einstein ring is a situation where if you're looking at a source, so this is us looking at the source, that the deflection angle is just, this is the lens here, the deflection angle is just so that the source exactly behind the lens is seen again by us in all directions. So this is true in all directions by symmetry, so this forms a kind of ring-shaped image on the sky around the position where the source is. So this is what we call an Einstein ring. The deflection angle here is just right send it back to us. <coughs> and so you can only get the situation when you have the perfect symmetry that is exactly in front of the source and that the lens is at. Now, we can look at what this Einstein ring means in our lens equation. We have the source exactly behind the lens, so it means that beta zero source position is exactly at the origin and therefore I have the very simple relation that the deflection on the sky is exactly equal to the, the difference of the oh, it's exactly equal to the image um, and so now we have all the information we need to plug all this in uh, and we can ask what get for such an Einstein. Um, so theta is equal to r over the distance to the deflector. This r is the, dis the physical distance to the lens here, the distance to the deflector. <coughs> um, and so therefore, that has to be equal to alpha, which is equal to alpha half times ds over s. And alpha half is equal to half of the square. So if we combine these two relations, we find that. m over r squared Did I do this right? Did I do this right? No. Uh, 
m over r squared is equal to d So if we now divide both sides by pi, then you find that this is equal to the average surface density within radius r, within this disk, that you need to get this exact Einstein ring configuration. This is, what we call this is what we call the critical surface density, critical surface density. For, lensing. for lensing. So if you have an area of the sky of the where sky, the average surface density average is exactly equal to this value here, then that's exactly the condition that you will need to get a ring, an Einstein ring, a lens ring of a point source exactly. And so this, that somebody asked this morning or the earlier this afternoon, how much mass for lensing to occur, this is the scale that defines basically the strength of all the lensing. And so we can put in some numbers. Um, for example, if you assume <coughs> that these distances are all of the order of a gigaparsec, so cosmological distances, and then you can put in the speed of light and the gravitation constant. And you find some number, find some number I have here. You get of the order of a little more of than a thousand solar masses per square parsec as the kind of surface density you need to cause lensing at a distance of something like a gigaparsec. But notice it depends on, on these three distances. It depends on whether the lens is, is where, how far away the source is, how far the lens is, and, and the ratio between those two. The lower this number is, the lower the critical density is, the stronger uh, the lensing effect will be. The more the less mass you need to cause an Einstein, Einstein ring means the, the more efficient lensing as a whole. And so it helps to make so these distances make these distance large, large, large to make the surface density low, surface density low. Um, um, simply because that's, the, because that's the, the way to, you can think about it, it means that the, the gravity has to do less work, you need less of a deflection angle to get the same, uh, the same pattern. So that's the critical surface density. And so we can, we, we, can we, we usually work in terms of dimensionless units where we divide the surface density by this critical number. We call that kappa. That's the critical, that's the dimensionless density for lensing. And similarly, the gravitational potential, we can turn into a dimensionless lensing potential, lensing potential. Uh, which we define. I'm not going to derive it here for you. But it's so that's the dimensionless potential. And it has the property that the gradient of psi is equal to the lensing angle. And the other thing you can show is the Laplacian of psi is twice the dimension of the surface. <coughs> so 
So in a sense, there's nothing so profound in here. This is simply taking the dimensions out of the problem of the and problem. simplifying, simplifying, and simplifying, 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 so that now we also have. So now we also have. Find a dimensionless surface, a dimensionless uh, lensing potential, potential whose gradient gives you the scale dimension. And all these dimensions are encoded in this critical density and this number, which is basically the critical density times uh, one of the distances squared. Okay, so so far this is fairly abstract and getting more and more abstract, so let's do a few concrete examples. And let's stay with simple models of axisymmetric lenses. So I'm going to do two examples. One is the point mass lens. And then the second one will be the what's called the singular thermal lens, which is a model for, uh, for galaxies. So in the point mass lens, point mass lens point the mass surface mass density is simply a delta function, total mass m. This is a point mass with mass m. We've seen the potential already. Simply the logarithmic, the logarithmic, um, the logarithm, natural logarithm of, natural the, of the radius, and so therefore we can use all the information we have, and get our deflection angle, which is equal to four over c squared times the gradient of this. And this is exactly what we had before with our Newtonian. With the first calculation we did this afternoon was the deflection angle due to a point mass. And that's exactly what so you see that now we have all the now that we have all this formalism in place, these calculations are a lot quicker. Let's do the lens equation. I'm trying to remember to put the lines above the numbers lines above. So I've replaced R again by dB times theta. Get the turn everything into angles. And this here, everything is radial by, by symmetry. So this is now along the radial, along the, the unit vector from the origin. So our point mass is here in the middle. And all the deflections are exactly radial by symmetry. Is this the notation that you use for a unit vector? Okay. All right. All right. We can rewrite this as rewrite this as where I've introduced this quantity C quantity to E.
which we call the Einstein angle for reasons that you will see in a little while. And actually you can see from this that we, do, we could have done this with the scaled potential as well. Scale potential, if you gra take its gradient with respect to theta, should give you this deflection angle, so theta e squared times the log of theta. So it comes to the same thing. And so this theta e squared is some measurement of some measure of the, the strength of the lens, and it's not surprising that it scales with the mass. It's kind of what you expect. So that's our lens equation now. And now I have no longer, have no longer written it as vectors, but simply I'm taking a cut along radius by symmetry. This is now just a relation between the amplitude, between the sizes of these vectors. Taken some random. Along there. Okay, so what does this look like? Okay, so, so this means, in principle, you can solve this, right? If I give you a source position, you can solve this equation for theta, and that will tell you where the images are. And if you do this, you will find that there will always be two points. Point length always gives you two images for every given source. <coughs> solve this graphically, which is more useful because of what it shows. If we plot theta versus and this is a diagonal relation where the two angles are equal. At large radius, at large theta, this term will become very small, and so you'll asymptote to this curve. Uh, when the angle gets smaller, you fall below it. In fact, the relationship looks something like this. Asymptotically, the diagonal, but the closer you get into the center, the further away you drop from it. And you go through zero at precisely this t to e parameter. When t is equal to t to e, then you get 1 minus 1. So the way to read these diagrams, so remember beta is the source position, the unlensed position, theta is the image position. And so the way to read these diagrams is to say I have a source at a particular position. Here, for example, where do I find an image? And you simply take a take the intersection and you say the images are here. Question? Probably because I forgot. Probably because I forgot. Here? Here? Yes, let's put it in. Thank you. I could also do the thing of saying C is equal to 1, but that's equal to 1. Okay. It's always very difficult when you're standing close to the board to see all the I'm glad that you're helping. So, so when you. So when you have a source at a particular position here, then you see that there are actually there are two images. One of the images is going to be very close to, uh, to where the source is. It's very close to the diagonal. But there's another image actually on the other side at negative. So if we draw this, let's say that I have a... Then what this equation tells me, what this graph tells me, is that there's one image it's at a la slightly larger theta than uh, the theta equal but there's another one which is inside inside this uh, radius of theta e uh, and fairly close to the center somewhere here if I had a different source which is further away here then the deflection would be smaller, so the image would be almost at the same pla place as the, as the source. And this other image would be even closer to the center. Right? With another, 
another case further up here, you have the even closer diagonal here and even closer here. So this is a way of graphically showing the relationship between theta and beta. Now this is a case where you could also solve it exactly, but it's in more general potentials that can be the case. You cannot convert this directly. And graphically you see what happens. And the next example we show, uh, you'll see the common Okay. Another thing you can read off from here is something about the sizes of the universe. Because right now we're simply considering where a single point falls, how, how a single light ray is lens. Uh, but of course, sources have a finite size. And so you can ask yourself, what happens if I don't have a single source at a single beta, but I have a source in a range of beta? So this is now a source whose size on the sky is between this lower and this upper upper limit. And what you see is, you can simply ask yourself, where do both ends of this source appear? And you see that here the slope is almost one of this line. We're very close to the diagonal. That means that the image that you find is going to be almost as big as the source, right? This extent here is going to be about the same as this extent here. So this image is not very much to be magnified. But this image here, this is here, things are very steep. And so even though you have quite a large range in beta, that projects into a very small range. It was a very small range of image So this image here, this one here, is going to be a lot smaller. The size, the extent in beta, is much larger than the extent in beta. Source was much larger. And the other thing you can do is what happens when you have a source uh, exactly at the origin. So a source here at the origin is this line here, and you find two images at plus and minus theta. So that's you have the source right in the middle, right behind the lens, and then you find that you have images here and here, and in fact by symmetry also at all other angles. So you will make this ring. So that's where you get the Einstein ring when it's equal to zero. And then to the other side, you can face the other side, the inverse relation. So in it, you don't need this part of the diagram. And so again, what's important so again, to realize is that everything here is set here by is the set. size of this key type. All the dimensions of the problems are in here. So if you have a, a different lens, which you put at a different distance so that this numbers change, or you put it at a, you give it a different mass, you will get exactly the same shapes, exactly the same geometry, exactly the same properties, exactly this curve, exactly the same lensing equation here. But on the sky, everything will be scaled by this, which sets the size of the answer. But apart from that, everything will be identical. It's the only dimension in the problem. Questions about this? So when we come to talk about microlensing, which is lensing by point objects in our own galaxy, then this point lens is going to be basically all we talk about. The double point, as much as we will talk about. And this, this Einstein ring uh, radius will come back finally. So that's the point mass. And now let's compare that with a case where we don't have a, uh, a single single star or a single point mass as a lens, but where we have a, an extended object, like the candle. So for that, so for that I have a question. A question. Okay, is it okay, is because of the symmetry, of the you symmetry obtain from you this, obtain uh, from this uh, a ring, a ring. but uh, how but can you obtain a, a cross? Okay, four points okay, instead four of... Point instead of of a of a ring, uh, not a with ring. an axis. Not with an axis. This is because of because of the axis. Otherwise, you cannot. Otherwise, you cannot get. You okay. cannot get okay. So these crosses indicate that there is non axis. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the other hand you, have you have here just the position, here of, the just the position of, the of the images, but not the, but not the amount, of, of amount of light coming from, light from, from each image, from no, right? Image. So right. this is another completely different problem. That's a, it's, of course, it's 
to all of this because it's it governed by governed how much each of the different parts of the source are, are left. And we'll come to that later today, I hope. But, uh, it, it's sort of related to the gradient of this curve. The gradient of this curve tells you that this source is going to be much smaller and therefore we get many fewer light rays from it in this image. So this, this image will be a lot fainter than this image. Okay, so example two was okay, a, so example two was a galaxy. galaxy. And for the galaxy, I'm going to take again an axisymmetric model called the singular isothermal sphere. And the singular isothermal sphere is the density distribution which goes like Uno, 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 Two images. It's just like <laughs> images. Can you see me double as well, or just here? I guess many of these phenomena you could make with sound as well. Okay, back to the. Okay, so this is in, in three dimensions. This is the, the density distribution of a singular isothermal sphere. It's just a normalization constant multiplied by a one over r squared dependence. And this is an interesting model because it gives you a flat rotation curve which is what we see in many galaxies, at least in the outer regions where the rotation curves stay flat and do not drop off. It's an indication for lots of dark matter in these The corresponding 3D potential is again a natural logarithm, but now of the three-dimensional radius r. And we can integrate the density to give us the surface mass density, and I will spare you the integral. It's not a very complicated one. So the surface mass density goes like 1 over r, 1 over the projected radius. The three-dimensional density goes like 1 over the three-dimensional radius squared. Why is called an, is an isothermal sphere? The isothermal part is because if you make a self-gravitating system where everything has the same temperature, then this is the natural gravitational field that, is, that it equilibrates. And you also have a, a one where the center, so here the center density goes infinite. There's also models which are non-singular where the central density is finite. And those are the, the classical non-singular isothermal spheres, but they don't have a nice potential. It turns out this is actually this is, actually is a actually ridiculously simple model, but it's actually a very good model for the matter. Okay. Uh, so if this is the surface mass density, then again, write down. Lensing potential in two dimensions is. So the deflection angle, deflection angle four pi sigma squared over c squared. Square. Right. So, so this potential has the potential property that the deflection, the angle, the deflection angle, angle always has the same magnitude. It has a different direction, it always points radially, but it's everywhere the same. You can see that the potential goes like R, so the gradient is And so this is different from here. Here we had the deflection angle, which drops off like one of R. 
So this is a different potential where, again, we still have an axisymmetric situation. We still have radially, uh, we still have the, the light rays being pushed out radially, but the radial dependence is different compared to the point. So we can again draw the lensing equation. Oh, we can do the scale deflection angle first. And so if we draw the same diagram as we drew here, where we draw beta against theta, again, here's the, the diagonal. <coughs> I'm going to call this constant angle theta E again. It's going to turn out to be the Einstein angle. And so what we see is that is theta minus alpha. Again, no vectors Again, because no everything vectors is in the, in the same direction along the radius. And so we simply see the relation. When theta is positive, theta is simply equal to theta minus alpha. And when theta is negative because of the sign change, you actually have to add. And so you see, in some ways, it looks similar to here. Similar to here. You have the same situation the same where situation everything where is basically stretched out along the diagonal. Along the diagonal. Things happen near the origin. Near the origin. But apart from that, the, the details are different. Details are different. And again, here, I should have said again, that the said position that where beta is equal to zero happens at theta equals plus or minus theta e. Again, this is the size of the Einstein ring. This is where the image is of the source be precisely behind the lens. <coughs> and so here again, you can play the same game as before. You can pick a source position, and you can ask yourself, where will I see images? If I pick a source position here, an image here, and an image here, you see that here the images are always the same distance apart. They're always exactly 2 feet e apart. Again, the Einstein radius here, if I have a source, now this position, for example, then I will have one source, and I have one image here, which is exactly P to E outwards, and I have another image here, which is exactly P to E in the other direction. But you notice that when I have an image here, unlike in the point mass case where I will always find two solutions here, I suddenly only get one solution. There's no solution on this side anymore. I simply get a solution. So if I have a source, which lies outside the Einstein radius, then the only image I have is an image which is a direct, which is a an amount C to E for the output, but I don't have an image. So One of the exercises I will give you for this evening is to play with this lens. Now the, now the both of these cases are, are kind of unusual because they have singularities in them. At the origin, something something bad happens. If you make a general lens model in which the, the density doesn't go to infinity in the middle and the potential doesn't have a, a singularity then you will find things which at large radii basically behave the same way because at large radii you don't really care too much about what happens in the middle but it will different color it will change the behavior in the central regions into something that's mathematically more smooth so it might be something like this <coughs> similarly to move the point mass to take a concentrated distribution point mass lenses then again at large radii I think it would stay the same but at small radii you might smooth things out these things out and you see that that changes a few things in important ways it still keeps the Einstein lens it still keeps the Einstein radius right you still have two images for, uh, for beta equals zero 
but you will find that there is always a maximum beta, always a maximum beta rather a minimum beta, rather beyond, beyond which you do not get multiple beta. So now, so if now you have a smooth curve like this, which doesn't have singularities, like then you either cut it in exactly one place, far from the lens, same on the other side, or you would cut it in three places. Same thing here. You either cut it just in one place, or when you go below, between these two peaks, you would cut it in three places. And so, in a sense, these singular models, the singular isothermal sphere and the point mass, have kind of lost this central, this third solution in the singularity somewhere. As soon as you remove the singularity, you will always end up with the third solution. It's the general properties of lenses that they always produce an odd number of images. So, if you have an even number of images, that means that you swallowed something in the singularity somewhere. And the reason is that at large radii, the behavior is basically fixed. At large radii, you have to come back to theta equals beta because the reflection angle goes, to, goes down to zero, goes back to zero. And so in the middle, whenever you cut such a curve, uh, you either cut it once or the curve has folded once or the curve has folded twice or three times. Each of those gives you two extra crossing points. So there's a lot of, I'm not going to go into it in this course, but there's a lot of interesting topology and catastrophe here associated with classifying the solution of this lens. And that's really because it's, it's simply a, a, a remapping of, of two-dimensional sky through some mathematical function. And as long as you don't have any singularities in there, you of course, you, uh, you know, you have all these topological constraints. Any questions on this? Is not G? Is not G? Did I miss something? Where? Is not G lacking over there? I don't know. Here? I'm trying to no to compare. The yeah. Einstein radius in, the, in this case would be. Yeah, no, here there's no G. What counts here, and you can see it by the dimensions. So the, this is a velocity dispersion, basically the temperature of this gas. And that's divided by C squared. That's divided by this angle of dimension. So in this case, the. Okay. Okay. So as I said, for the for the homework, you the homework you get to play with with, uh, with this lens. Hello. Okay. How much time do we have? Forty-five minutes. So then, let's go to another property. This. And that's the curves that I showed you before in the, in the slides. So in the, in the, in the so first point the of the exercises, of the, exercises the, idea the idea is just is try to draw, try to draw the, the shape the of the shape lens, the lens uh, circular galaxy, uh, right? Circular galaxy, mm -hmm. right? Just, just, just make a sketch. Make a yes, sketch. but so not need to be precise. No, 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 no. It's just to get, to, to get an idea of what the images will look like. And in fact, what I will do tomorrow is I will give you a lot of choice, and I will ask you which one looks most like the, the real answer. So just try to do as good a job of understanding what the image distribution would be like, and then you can, you can, like in the police, right? You can find the best match. So does that mean we're going to be going over the homework problems in class? Uh, I will, once you've done the test, I will briefly go through the... Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. But I can't do it in much detail because there isn't that much time. Um, um, but so the point is that you have to solve the lensing equation to do this, but this is really a one-dimensional representation. It's important to realize what this means on the sky. All right, so then let's go to the, uh, I think, the almost the final piece of, of mathematics that we have to do to set the scene for the fundamentals for lensing, and that's to go to this critical curve. And critical curves are about what happens when you have an extended source. So this is related to the question about magnification, whether all the images are equally large and equally bright.
So because this deflection angle deflection is angle different in different parts of the sky, if you have a large sky, source, a large source all, parts of the image, all parts of the image, all parts of the source are not pushed the source by, the same amount. by the same amount. Some parts will be pushed more, some parts will be pushed less, and that will cause a distortion of the deformation of your, of your source. And the way you do that is you have this mapping from source to image. And what you would like to know to, to understand how sources are deformed is to also look at the derivative of this. You want to look how each particular vector in your source is mapped into a new vector in your image. And as long as the sources are not too big, you can simply work the first order. So all we need to know is the gradient of the deflection angle as a function of position. <coughs> now we have now we have very strange I cough and then two seconds later here. So they are twice six. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Um, so we have the lensing uh, equation, which is theta minus alpha. alpha. So d beta by d theta, so d beta by d is equal to. Okay. Right? Right? You know the delta function. You know the delta function. Now, what, what the indices what, mean? What the indices they, they are counting what? Are this counting is now coordinates one and two in the plane of the stack. So this is so this is so my vector b is equal to b to one r two r two. Right. So I need to know how how a little segment in the x direction is affected by the lensing, how a little segment in the y direction is affected by the lensing. So I need to do all the four combinations. One, two. I'm going to make a distortion matrix. And because we know the deflection and angle the depends, depends on the depends on deflection on potential, potential, we can write this as uh, as the second derivatives second of, the of, the of the first uh, alpha is the first gradient. Alpha We're taking the second gradient. gradient. That gives us the second derivative. And it's a good thing that we're ready to all of this in dimensionless coordinates because otherwise we would have to carry all the four G C squares everywhere all the time. So this way we've really simplified this as much as possible. Now, now, so this is really a matrix. This is really a matrix. So we can write this as one, one for the delta functions minus. I'm using this common notation instead of the section. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. If so I know the potential varies with position, the first gradient gives me the deflection angle, the second gradient gives me the rate of change of the deflection angle. This is really all I need to know how the angle in the plane is changed into rectangle in the, in the image. So the, to clarify the notation, this C. Comma one one wow. means derivative. Uh, derivative. Uh, right. This is a comma. This is a it's comma. a comma. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's not very nice. It's just I go crazy if I, I go have crazy to keep on writing it like this. It doesn't come in anymore. Sometimes, actually, I drop Sometimes the comma as well. I drop the comma. Like one one. This is interesting, isn't it? This is interesting. Okay, now the, the okay, this is usually the, written, this is usually written as, as and I will explain where this comes from in a second. Written in terms of these three, you see there are independent things, right? The second derivative one two is the same as the derivative two one. So there are three independent numbers here, and these are often written in terms of kappa gamma one and gamma two, which are known as the convergence. And the shear components. Shear. 
and you see it's just, uh, and you see it's, just it's obvious that these are the same <laughs> when you look at it. <coughs> and the reason that this is more useful is that these, these are three different terms which actually do something very different to the images themselves. So the convergence, for example, suppose you have a matrix where you have only convergence, then Then you find that a little, that a little vector dx dy, dx dy by, this by this transformation gets turned into gets turned the same vector but multiplied, vector by, multiplied by constant by 1 minus k. So this simply so this for all scales for the size of your image. If you have only gamma 1, then what you see is that the x is multiplied by 1 minus gamma 1, and the y is multiplied by 1 plus gamma 1. In other words, you get a stretching. So here, you have a round source. It gets turned into a round source of a different size. Here, if you have a round source, it gets turned into a stretched source. It gets size increased in x and decreased in y or vice versa and if you have gamma 2 that's actually a little bit more complicated so I'm not going to write the answer but I'm going to draw the, the effect the effect is the same stretching but along the diagonal and actually the way the easiest way to write what happens to gamma what, uh, what gamma 2 does is to say what it does to dx plus dy and dx minus dy and it turns one it increases one and it decreases the other one so these are so these are like these are completely like general, general, general affirmations, affirmations that you can get uh, when you look at any linear mapping linear and expand it to the to first order, right? This is all you can do. You simply turn, uh, you simply change the size or change the form, change the shape, and this decomposes them into three different effects: convergence and shear along the axes or shear along the diagonals. <coughs> Um, so, so, and remember that in the end, all these things the come, end, from the come from the potential. It comes from your surface mass distribution. So, if I give you any lens, you have all the machinery to work out what all these various shears and convergences are everywhere on this. Simply by taking the potential and plugging it in here, this will tell you how much convergence you have, how much shear. And so, then that will actually tell you what image is and what images are what or are they stretched in x are they stretched in y are they and so some of the the arcs that I showed you in the beginning when I showed you Im images of galaxy clusters lensing background galaxies these large distortions that all comes from the fact that some of these terms end up being very large in some of these lenses. and it's actually this this is what makes gravitational lensing really can can deform galaxies and increase their size tremendously and, uh, can really give you a lot of extra really give you a lot of extra right. um, what else did I want to say about this and the inverse the, the inverse is also true if, if you see the which kind of deformation the lens produces you can recover the it C the potential, the Indeed. scalar potential yeah. of the Of course, the problem is that you don't know, it's like I said before, you don't, it's not a physics experiment, you cannot take out the lens to see what the real shape of the source is. So if I give you a source that looks like this, ah, yes. two things can happen. Either the source looks like this, or the source looks like this, and it's lens, or anywhere in between. So life is never easy. But in weak lensing, there are techniques to try to extract exactly this kind of information. Because you don't know what the shapes of individual galaxies are, but you do know that on average, galaxies are not all 
in the y direction on the sky. The y direction. So the sky is the old. Sky is the old. That's not physics. That's, that's not something that's in the lens. So, so you can pull out this information statistically by averaging over log. But in individual cases, individual always missing the crucial piece of information: how big and what shape was the source before this lens came. Um, okay, so okay. another thing to notice, this is, thing to notice, this is the, the gradient of the map from, the map from image to, image to uh, source, which is the, the easy way to go. Right? If I give you the image positions and the lens, you can simply do the math and work out where the light ray is. Of course, what you would like to know is the inverse. You would like to know if I have a source, which is a produce. Um, and so... Uh, so the, 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 sec the second exercise the second is, exercise is just do, it, do this, right? Do this, right? I don't remember what the second exercise <laughs> is. You give us, you give us the, potential? the potential? Uh, you can do it that way. You can also do it. So you give us the, pot you give us the potential and... The potential and you give you the potential and that's enough to work out the deflection angles everywhere. And in principle, that's enough. But once you've done this, you can actually see whether there is shear or. I see you're looking forward to spending a long night. Spending a long night. Yes. So. Yes. So. Now what happens? Now what? Happens, uh, Is this mapping invertible or not? Mapping invertible. So when the lensing so is the very weak, when there's weak, no when lensing potential or these no potentials are very small, these are very small, these are going to be a lot less than one. Basically, this matrix is going to be very close to a diagonal matrix with ones on the diagonal. So this is not a singular matrix. This is not a matrix. It's a very mild distortion, very but it's not going to cause any perfectly invertible but if you have but large if you have, if you have large lensing where have lensing these kappas and these gammas are large it goes to one then you have situations where this mapping is not invertible where the determinant of this mapping is zero if the determinant of this mapping of this mapping this mapping is not invertible that means that cannot go from the source position to the lens position and get a unique answer. So if this mapping beta to theta is one to one, then that is anywhere uh, we have no problem. When this mapping is no longer one to one, that's when you start to get multiple images. That's when the lensing gets interesting. And that's signposted by the fact that this determinant goes to zero. So if at some point on the sky, remember the, these terms vary on the sky, if at some point on the sky this mapping is not locally invertible, that means that there is some possible, that's, that's where you're creating multiple images. So is that clear? So this, oh, this, ma this matrix is multiplying what? The dx, dx, dx dy yep. vector. It's multiplying source vectors to give you image. No, to give you just image just a differential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a local, yeah, the local transformation. Yeah. So the whole mapping can move. I mean, everything can be moved by five degrees on the sky. It doesn't matter. It's the relative motion. It's the relative motion, which is what you capture in these in these second derivative in these derivatives of the. Now, so if we if we, so we, 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 we we use this matrix to solve the scroll in two. The idea is try to invert the. You can do it without. You don't have to. You can also simply apply the, the lensing equation at each of the corners. Ah yes. And, and draw. And you will see that you know it does something which is very similar to to a local linear distortion. That's probably the easier way to do it.
Um, but so the point is that, that so this is that, that if, we, if you, you look everywhere in the sky, everywhere you calculate this matrix and you see that the determinant is everywhere non-zero, so that the mapping is everywhere invertible, then you know that there is only one image of every source. Because nowhere do you go through the singularity that you need to create multiple images. It's only when you make the lens stronger and stronger and stronger and uh, at some point this mapping no longer becomes invertible locally that you're able to create uh, multiple images. So, so the locus on the sky of this distortion matrix is called A. That's called the critical curve. That's called the critical curve. And this means that in those positions, if you have positions, if you have an image and you, melt, you map it through A to see what it looked like in the source plane, then you find that you get something which has... I mean, the determinant is basically the change in A. So when the determinant goes to zero, it means that you've completely flattened this rectangle in one direction. So you may have turned to a line this way, you may have turned to a line this way, whatever. But you've squeezed the area of this piece of this image plane into zero in the source plane. And why is that interesting? Because it why means when you go in the other direction, it means you've direction. taken an infinitely small part of the source plane and stretched it into a finite amount of image. So you've created infinite magnification. And this is where lensing it into. It means that you've really magnified a small, very, very small part of, of the sky into a, a large area. So, so this is the image plane. This distortion matrix tells you what it looked like in the source plane. And it tells you that this finite area of sky finite came from a zero area of sky. Area of sky. So the inverse, the inverse has infinite magnification. infinite magnification. And that's why these critical curves are very interesting. If you understand your lens and you know where these critical curves lie, then this is the part of the sky where you will have, where your gravitational telescope will be extremely effective, where you're magnifying greatly the sources that lie behind. <coughs> and so in the, some of the diagrams that I showed you that you have in the handouts, those red diagrams with, uh, with the colored dots and the, the white curves, those white curves in the left-hand panel, the elliptical curves, those are the critical curves uh, that you get for those particular lenses. Um, so those are the areas, and that's those also where you see that the, the images near them are very large. Ah, you have them in black and white. In the web page. The web page. So this page, the page with the, the Einstein cross. The other three panels. Um, um, yeah, it will take too long to get it on the screen. The other three panels show you for different lenses. They show you on the left the image plane, on the right the source plane. So on the right you see uh, a few little small round sources and on the left you see what they look like when seen through the lens. And that white curve that you have there, the white elliptical or round curve on the left, that's the critical curve and you see that near the critical curve all the images that you find are very largely extended in one direction, very strongly stretched. And that's because of this, this, uh, this fact that the, the distortion matrix is completely squashed one direction very strongly. Now, if you take these critical now curves on the sky the and you map them back to the source plane, to the source plane. then you get what are called the costics. And so the caustics are drawn on the right 
in these diagrams, and there are the little diamond-shaped things, diamond these, these stars that you see in the two non-axisymmetric non cases. In the, the round lens on the top left, you don't see There's no problem. So these are the positions in the source plane where you have to put a source for it to be to end up on the critical curve and therefore for it to be very, very strongly magnetic. So it's really the same. There, there are two sides of the same thing. The caustic is in the source plane. The critical curve is in the lens plane. But it's the same light rays that you're talking about. Same, same case. Any source that lies anywhere on this curve is going to end up somewhere on the critical curve and therefore be infinitely magnified. That point will be infinitely magnified. And so when we talk about strong lensing by galaxies tomorrow, then the, um, uh, these kind of things will become very important. So this is going to come back. So this matrix is, is to go from image to source, right? This matrix goes from image to source because it's, it's the derivative of the derivative of the image as a function of, of image sorry, of function source as a function of image. Source as a goes from image. So at that point, the determinant that point through, of course, you really course want to go from source to image, which makes the determinant infinite, which is what, what sets the magnitude. So we can write this magnification in terms of the kappas and the gammas. Define gamma as the magnitude of this uh, gamma one and gamma two shear. It's really you can you can think of gamma one and gamma two as, as rotated versions of the, of the same thing. So, so this is the determinant of the distortion matrix, and so this is what has to be equal to zero on the critical curve. And so again, once you have a lensing potential defined, it's a simple matter of calculating this determinant everywhere. You have the whole recipe um, and simply plotting the contour of where it's equal to zero. In fact, that's how I made these plots. Simple determinant equals zero contour. Now, if you look at this, you see a few, uh, I mean, unless you look more in detail at the lensing mapping, this, this doesn't tell you that much. But there's one thing which we can tell for sure, which is that if If kappa is equal to one, equal to one somewhere, somewhere on the sky, somewhere on the sky, then the determinant, then the determinant of a, a is going to be equal to a negative number, right. at best zero. Right. Far away from a lens. Far away from a lens. Kappa and gamma are very, very small, and therefore the determinant there is simply equal to 1. Which is what you expect, right? There's no distortion when there's no lensing. And so, because far from a lens, the determinant has to be equal to 1. If kappa is equal to 1 somewhere, the determinant goes negative. That means somewhere in between, the determinant has to go to 0. means you change the parity of the image. Which again is not that interesting if you don't know what the image looks like beforehand. But yes, you're right. 
But so the point I'm trying to make here is different, which is that the, you know, cap distance determinant has to go through zero for this multiple imaging to occur, for the, the lensing to be non-invertible. Um, and we've, we've shown here that if at any, anywhere on the sky cap is one, then uh, somewhere there must exist a point where this determinant goes inactive to zero. Which is what you need to give multiple images. And now remember what kappa now equals one means. Kappa is equal to surface density. Ah, I haven't told you that. This is this is the Poissonian. This is del squared psi. And so del squared psi was equal to two kappa. Was equal to the twice the surface density over the critical surface density. And so this here, so this here is actually equal to the kappa is the dimensionless surface density scaled by the critical surface density. And so this again shows the importance of this number, this critical surface density, which if anywhere in your lens you exceed the surface density, then you're creating multiple limits. The end process to make lens do multiple imaging without ever going above the critical, but they're always going to have to come close unless you do something very special. You can you can create a lot of shear with not much kappa, and also get a get this determinant to change sign. <coughs> but this kappa equals one is a is a is a sufficient condition. Now, unfortunately, the unfortunately doing experiments with this, it's actually very difficult to find simple analytic examples of these things that you can work with. So, so most of the intuition that people have built up for this is by taking lens models and putting them in the computer and, and finding where these, these uh, critical curves lie. Um, one of the exercises, I think the third exercise I give you tomorrow, to try to calculate to try not to these full critical not curves, not but at least to, to do a few calculations to, to figure out what the shape of these curves would look like. Uh, and again, one of the homework yeah, one of the homework tomorrow will be to, to, to see how it works. But I have a question but because a the, the lens in potential T is given in terms of x and y. X ah. y. Okay? Ah. Which are one and two. But actually, okay. So x and y are theta 1, theta 2, or Theta one theta multiplied one by, by d or d no just theta one theta two so x so is theta x one yes y is theta yes. two why is theta two <laughs> good that you saw that yes that you saw that yes so I'm using x and y just as as a two-dimensional coordinates for this Okay. okay. I have one more quick topic, more quick topic more and then I think we're done for today. We're done for today. And that quick topic, quick topic is the final concept that we're going to need for the, the strong lensing chapter of tomorrow. Chapter of tomorrow. <coughs> Can I move this? Can I move this? Ah, okay. Remember that the images of the, the images all the blackboards black are, are in the videos. So you can capture so you can capture the blackboards from the videos. Black <laughs> <from the> video. <laughs> <laughs> Although if you Although want to give us your, give us your class notes, class notes class I don't know. I, I can I hardly know, read them myself, so I wouldn't. <laughs> So this fine is something else, something else uh, about the lensing potential. About the lensing potential. And that's its relation yes. to something called the something called potential. The potential.
So here's our Lenzing equation again. Back in terms of vectors, so no axisymmetric uh, assumption anymore. And you can write this as this. Find this thing tau, which is called the Fermat potential. Which is made up of the lensing potential and a purely geometric term, theta minus beta squared. And then if you take the gradient with respect to theta of the potential, all the stationary points of this, of this potential give you exactly the solution to the lensing equation. So the stationary points of the Fermat potential are identically equal to the solutions of the lensing equation. And in some ways, this is the more fundamental way of, of looking at the, what goes on in lensing. <coughs> because the Fermat potential you can show is equal to the arrival time of the light rays, or the light travel time. So if you have us here and a source here, with its unlensed and lens direction B theta, then what this uh, uh, dimensionlessly tells you is how long light rays travel starting at beta and ending up coming from, from theta. And it consists of two points, two, two terms. This theta minus beta is simply the difference in the length of this path with this path, as I've drawn it. And there's an extra term here, which is what's known as the Shapiro delay, which is the relativistic effect that in a gravitational field, you travel more slowly, or the, the light is delayed. The clocks change. <coughs> and so this, this Fermat, this, this geometric effect with this Shapiro delay, and then it, it's basically like the principle that the, the sources or the images that you find are places where all the nearby light rays arrive roughly at the same time, and have constructed interference between neighboring parts. And so this is a very geometric way of looking at things. This, this uh, Fermat potential is the, you pick your source position, and then you get a nice surface in the surface in, in the image plane. And that surface will have maxima, will have minima, will have subtle points, will have other points. And so all the images appear at either the maxima or the minima or the subtle points of this, of this surface. And then if you are changing the potential or moving beta, then you can see how the subtle and minima will move. You can you can have uh, points merge and annihilate and things like this. So it's a very good way of, of seeing the geometry, how image formation really is. So C is re it related to the Chapido delay. C. According to. C is exactly the Chapido delay. Yeah, up to M squared and things. Very well. Because it's basically, again, it's the integral of the gravitational field along the path. It's the cumulative effect of this time delay. And we're integrating the, the 3D potential, 3D potential through the lens. So it's again a projection. Again a projection. So all these things are so explaining things quite some detail very nicely in, in chapter one, in the first book of the, the ones I put online. OK. And so for example, if you pick a particular beta, then you see that without a lens, so now you have to, this is where I, I'll show you that I'm not very good at drawing in, in three dimensions. So this is the, the image plane theta. I've picked a particular beta. So the minimum of this potential is here. And now this is without a potential. If you now add a lensing potential, and that lensing potential is going to form a kind of bump around where your source is. 
around where your lens is rather, and it's going to create maximum and minimum. It's going to make a bump in this. So if there's no lensing, then there's only one stationary point of the surface, which is in the middle, theta equals theta, right? The source is, the image is where the source is because there's no lensing. When you add a, a lensing potential to this by adding this thing, then you find that you create a new source position here, sort a new image position here, a new image position here. And this image moves a little bit to this image. And tomorrow I will show you lots of movements which show this, this kind of uh, thermal potential in action. <coughs> but it can be very complicated because your lens can have complicated two-dimensional structure. This thing has two-dimensional structure. So this is actually a very nice way of seeing why you get four image solutions in slightly elliptical lens. Um, um, the, we can put the dimensions in here as well just to be complete. I can find it. So the arrival time is actually So when later we consider uh, what happens in multiple image quasars where the image where, where the quasar has a flare and then at different times this flare arrives in image 1, 2, 3, 4 of the quasar then these arrival times are attacked. And what this shows is that if you measure this, this tape between the flare arriving in the first image and the second image you actually measure some combination. If you, know, if you have a good lens model, if you know the lensing potential you have a very good measurement of the combination of these distances which gives you doing geometry in the universe, trying to determine the Hubble time. Okay. So that's the Fermat potential. Okay, so that was all of okay, so that we went through today. And I hope I hope that well two things can happen. Either this is going to keep you up all night because there was so much information. Or tomorrow you will be ready to, to really play with strong lenses and understand with the main concepts in your head uh, what's actually going on. Okay, I'll stop there. The last thing I had is some recommendations for things to read. So I, I don't know how much time you have to so you how much of this you do. So if you want to see some more of the material of what I described today in the book, then if you look in the first volume, which is the introduction volume, then chapter one is a kind of historical introduction, an overview of, of how lensing came to be recognized and, and evolved. And then the basics are in sections 2.1 to 2.5, and in 3.1 to 3.3. So this is basically the material that I went through today. You'll find it in there again. <coughs> and then if you want to prepare for tomorrow, which is going to be on strong lensing, then out of book two, which is of course the strong lensing book, uh, I suggest that you look at chapters 3.2, 3 and 4. So the earlier chapters of this book are basically a recap of the introduction. This is the specific stuff on strong lensing that we will be covering. So if you have a chance to take a look at it beforehand, it will help you to follow. Okay. Okay. That's it. Ok, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bueno, entonces, bueno, entonces, ¿alguna duda? ¿Alguna duda? Rela pues, Rela pues, para mañana. Para recuerden mañana. que todos recuerden los que todos libros, los, el, libros, los libros que menciona los Kuhn libros están en la página. Están en la página. Correcto. Correcto. Eh, eh, recuerden que recuerden yo. Que yo. Be, be careful, the books are on the website are in a funny order. So just because it's the second one doesn't mean that it's book two. So make sure you look at the right one. Okay, so the, 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 the number is inside. The, the, the they're not even numbered, so they're, but they're called strong lensing, weak lensing, micro lensing. So, oh, so it should be obvious. So the book one, the book one is 
one. Book one is the first one. That's the introduction. The that's yes, actually introduction. the introduction. Okay. But then the book two is strong lensing. I forget in which order you have them on the web page. Okay. But they they're not called book three four. Okay. So, entonces mañana, eh, yo voy a estar desde las 8 de la mañana en mi oficina. Eh, hay, hay una actividad que ustedes saben es un mini curso, eso no tiene evaluación, es digamos de actualización, es para quien quiera aprender a programar eh, tarjetas de video para hacer supercomputación. Eh, quien quiera pasar por la oficina eh, entre las 8 y las 12, Bienvenido, preguntas para hacer los problemas. I don't, I, I, I don't think so that these guys will pass overnight because they are <laughs> already have a lot of exams. So, but if you, if you say, van, si ustedes van a estar trabajando mañana en la mañana, pasen por la oficina. También va a estar Kuna allá en la oficina. Voy a estar. El punto es el siguiente. Como there is a theory in, in, in academy that says that every problem looks hard. Hard when you see when the problem see the first time, the first right? Time. But with time you with time you get used to the problem and you start to, to see that the problem is not as complicated. Recuerden que el examen es sobre el ejercicio, de tal manera que hay que hacer el ejercicio para pasar la prueba. Los muchachos de astronomía que están eh, asistiendo al curso no están y digamos parte de los exámenes de los vale exámenes como exámenes vale de, otros como cursos. de otros cursos por favor ocúpense por favor, ocúpense. tengan en cuenta que el examen va a valer por varios exámenes entonces la cosa es que hay que estudiar ¿okay? es una recomendación general para ellos alguna otra pregunta esta noche les voy a mandar por correo no sé si han recibido mis correos un, una encuesta para que ustedes ahí opinen y digan qué cosas podemos cambiar miren que son solamente cuatro días es difícil pues que cuatro días cambiemos pero ustedes pueden hoy mandarnos una retroalimentación de que de que puede cambiar digamos de, de we want to, to have some feedback because it's hard to ask all of you you are shy to say, tell this right here so you can tell in the at, 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 at the at the at the, at the poll what what do you want to to change um, you want to change something i, I don't want to change anything <laughs> okay so okay. Nos vemos mañana a la una y a las cuatro otra vez.